Thank you. So I got the kind of questionable uh, honor of being the last speaker of the day. Uh, but you'll be happy to know that this is going to be a very basic talk. You should be able to understand everything I say. And if not, just ask me. Um, there's nothing, uh, I don't know. It should be all very, very basic. So my goal today is to prove uh, the following theorem. Um, that in an A infinity category, or well, maybe I'll just... Where's the eraser? Huh? Ah, okay. So, I'll stay slightly differently. Any quasi-isomorphism uh, between A, inf A infinity categories admits an inverse up to homotopy. And I'll explain uh, shortly what these terms mean. It will kind of remind you what they mean. Uh, they were presented in uh, the previous talk by Nati. Um, but I want to say that this is kind of an application, really, of two lemmas, uh, which are very useful building blocks for working with uh, two very useful tools for working with the infinity categories. Uh, so our strategy will be to State the two lemmas, prove the theorem as a kind of an application. Uh, one of them will be related to the title of the talk, the homological perturbation lemma. And then uh, we'll prove the lemmas. And then if I have time, maybe I'll give a, a simple example. So that's what, what I plan to do. Um, so before I remind you what, really the way I'm going to remind you is first to introduce a very a drastic but, well, a notational simplification. So I'm going to assume that our category C has just one object. <laughs> has just one object, x. And now let's see what, what this means. Um, so we can look at the hum, the endomorphisms of these objects, of this object. This is a vector space. And we have seen in the previous talk that it has this uh, operation, mu1, acting as a differential. So really, this is a complex. Um, and then we, ha we can compose operations, right? We can take two endomorphisms and compose them. This is de defined by an operation mu2 going from a tends a to a. This operation will not be uh, strictly associative. Right, there are two ways we can compose, but they, these two ways will differ by homotopy, which is encoded by the operation mu3. And more generally, we have operations mu k going from a tensor k to a. And these operations are required to satisfy a certain relation. Um, which I'll just write briefly, because you've seen it many times already and this will get you used to my kind of sloppy way of writing, as um, mu k1, mu k2 equals 0. OK? So we basically, these lines represent some tuple of elements, some tensor product of elements. And we apply these two operations in all the possible ways, keeping the order of the elements fixed, right? And we sum over all the possibilities. And another less drastic notational simplification is that I'm going to stop writing plus minuses everywhere because we all know that nobody writes signs in these topics, right? <laughs> so, um, so this is the infinity relation. Okay, so we say um, in this setup that we have a complex with these high operations, this is just called an A infinity algebra. And A infinity algebras relate to A infinity categories the same way that groups relate to groupoids or if you want to be more fancy, that monoids relate to categories, to classical categories. So whenever we take a single object in a category, the endomorphisms have a structure of a monoid. So if we take a so similar thing happens here. If we take an A infinity category, we look at a single object, the endomorphisms always have the structure of an A infinity algebra. Um, 
And, and I just want to emphasize, I called it a notational simplification, and you may think that I'm kind of cheating, and it's, but really it's just a way for me to avoid writing object indices everywhere and kind of keeping track of all the essential features are the same. Um, okay, so that's, that's what is an infinite algebra is. So let's continue unwinding what this notational simplification means. So recall, I think it was defined, I, I don't know, but the quasi-isomorphism in particular is just a bijection on objects, right? We require something also on, the, on what it does on the homology of the mapping spaces. But first of all, we have just a bijection of an object. So this means that D also has a single object. we denote by fx. Okay, and then we can look similarly at the complex home D between fx and fx. And it will also have these higher operations, which I'll denote by nu, nu k. This will be another a infinity, they satisfy the same relation, so this is another a infinity algebra. And now let's see what does it mean uh, that we have a functor. So f is a functor. So recall what this means is that we have some map F1, which is the map of home sets. Okay, we know X goes to Fx. On the, home, on the home level, we have a map from F1 from A to B. This map does not respect, com respect compositions on the nodes. It respects them only up to higher homotopy defined by F2, uh, which is a map from A tends of 2 to B, and et cetera, we have maps Fk from A to the K to B. And these, again, need to satisfy a relation, which I'll, I'll write as follows. Um, we require mu K1, uh, sorry, let me write it like this. So we write FK1 of mu K2, right? All the possible ways of composing F after applying mu is the same as, so here the, the really should be a sum is the same as applying new k, all the possible ways of composing new k on kind of f applications of new 2. And in the language of a infinity algebras, we say that f is a morphism. So maybe I'll write it just here. We say f from a mu to b nu is a morphism, is a, an A infinity morphism. Okay? So this is, um, we're almost done. We're almost ready to really reformulate our theorem. Um, the last piece of information that we have is that um, H, that F induces an isomorphism on the cohomological level. So what this means concretely is that, all right, so I'll write F is a quasi-isomorphism in our simplified setup just means that the induced map HF1 from the cohomology of A with respect to mu1 to the cohomology of B with respect to nu1 is an isomorphism. And I won't write it, but this, this is what we call a quasi-isomorphism of A infinity algebras. Um, so now we can really restate the theorem in the version that we're going to prove, and that is that uh, every uh, quasi-isomorphism of A infinity algebras admits an inverse up to homotopy. Oh, shoot, I forgot to say. So what is a homotopy? Um, I should have added that here. Homotopies are just the translation of natural transformations. Because I probably won't get to, this, to the actual step of constructing the homotopies, um, it's just a collection of maps, also from A tends of K to B, and they satisfy some relation. Right? This, this is like the condition of a pre-natural transformation being closed. If you want, you can. Okay. I don't think I'll need it, so I don't want to write it down. Um, okay, now let's state the two lemmas that I, I promised and then, um, and then prove the theorem. So the fir first lemma is called homological perturbation lemma.
And this is really a key tool in working with, uh, with infinity algebras or infinity categories. And it says the following. It says that if um, A mu uh, is, is an A-infinity algebra, we have the following structures. So I'm always bad at managing the board. So the first piece of the structure is that we have uh, an A-infinity algebra structure, mu tilde um, on HA. So HA is my notation for the cohomology of A with respect to mu1, uh, with mu tilde 1 equals 0. So that's the first part. The second part is that we have morphisms Second part, we'll talk about morphisms. And the third part, we'll talk about uh, homotopies. So so the second part, second part of the structure is that we have uh, just have A infinity morphisms. from HA to A and from A to HA, which are denoted by I and pi. And I write them as arrows, but remember, in, the, in your mind, just remember, this is a collection of maps from the tensor products to, uh, to the second uh, space. So these are, we have A infinity morphisms. Um, and the third part is that uh, we have homotopies OK, maybe I'll write it in, in a different order. So i composed with pi is homotopic to the identity on A. And pi composed with i is homotopic to the identity on HA. Um, now, I want to say that this is a nice formulation. But what we actually want in order to, to save ourselves some headache is to replace this condition by the less pleasing aesthetically but more convenient condition that the composition of the first component of pi and the first component of i is equal to the identity on HA. OK, so you can think of it as a kind of normalization. It implies these are actually equivalent formulations. So this is what we'll, uh, we'll prove or sketch the proof. Um, so that's the first lemma. Um, And the second lemma is uh, what I, I like to call the inverse function theorem. And it says that if, um, if f is a morphism between uh, A-infinity algebras, I'll just write A-infinity morphism, then f is invertible. if and only if uh, f1 is invertible. So you can see why I like to call this the inverse function theorem, because it really says that the invertibility of a morphism is detected by the linear part. And it's really not a bad, what? Hmm? Ah, OK, thought you were. So um, it's really not a bad way to think about it as of, of f as like a formal power series. And the way to make it formal I don't want to discuss it in too much depth, uh, is to basically take the, uh, the bar complex that was mentioned in Nati's talk, um, and then look at a filtration on it. right? And you can make it precise. Filtration just by the length of the tensors. Yeah? Uh, one, mu 
No, I don't think I, I don't think I need it. Um, you think I need the new one to be zero? What? Uh, OK, maybe. So I'll show you the proof, and then we can see. Uh, maybe I, it, I actually didn't. OK, so uh, that's right. It's possibly the one that needs to be 0. OK, so um, let me prove to you now the theorem using the two lemmas, and then we can prove the two lemmas. And we'll see uh, whether I cheated. Um, probably I have. OK, so the proof of the theorem. Um, so I remind you, we have uh, now we have uh, a quasi-isomorphism of A infinity algebras. We have A and B, and F is a morphism of A infinity algebras, which is a quasi-isomorphism, and we want to show that we can construct an inverse up to homotopy. So what can we do? Well, we can apply lemma one and lemma two, right? So let's start with lemma one. We construct maps. Like so, and now we can consider the map on uh, on cohomology, which is just a composition. Let's consider the map H, which is just a composition F composed with I A composed with pi B. Um, and now let's look at the first component of this H. So. Uh, I haven't talked about composing morphisms. I hope you remember. You basically write all the possible ways you can compose uh, the operations that you have. In this case, if you look at the linear part, there's only really one. You can only take the linear parts from each one of these operations. Um, so you really get pi b1 composed with f1 composed with i a1. And, and here I'm really using this kind of normalization to say that this is actually the induced map on homology. Otherwise, it would only be true up to some isomorphism. Um, so this is actually the induced map on, on homology. And we assume that it is invertible, right? This is the assumption that f is a quasi-isomorphism. So the upshot, of, now, now we use lemma 2, right? Which says that um, a map which, whose linear part is an isomorphism um, has an inverse. So here, indeed, mu1 equals 0. So in my application, <laughs> the stronger assumption definitely holds. Uh, so we construct h minus 1 by lemma 2. Um, so let's write invertible. So this means there exists an inverse. So now I mean an inverse in the infinity sense for the entire morphism for h. Um, and now let's see, uh, okay, so how will we construct G, our inverse for F? Well, there's really only one thing that you can, uh, you can think of. So maybe I'll write it here. G will just be the composition of the maps that you see in the diagram. So g will just equal to pi a, uh, oops, sorry, i, i a uh, h minus 1 pi b. Um, and now let's check that f composed with g is really homotopic to the identity. So what is f composed with g? It's just f composed with i a composed with h minus 1 pi b. Now we can introduce. Um, here, this is actually equal. Now we can take a homotopy, introduce here pi b i b, right? Because this is homotopic to the identity by the third part of the first lemma, of the perturbation lemma. So we get composed with f, composed with f, composed with i a h minus 1 pi b. And now we see that this is just h, right? So this is equal, because h and h minus 1 compose to 0, this is just equal to i b, uh, composed to the identity, this is equal to i b pi b, which is homotopic to the identity. Right, and the other direction is similar. And well, I don't know if you, if you notice, but I'm only using the homotopy in this direction, which made me suspicious because 
OK, never mind. I, I, you, can, you really need to use the homotopy only in this direction. Uh, the assumption that the composition in the other direction is the identity of, on the linear part is kind of used implicitly. Um, OK, never mind. It's a remark for I don't know who. Um, OK, so this is, and similarly, G composed with F is homotopic to the identity on F. It's very simple. OK, so we proved the theorem using the two lemmas. Now let's prove the two lemmas. Yes, there's a question. The composition, yes, the composition is strictly associated. Um, okay. So I'll actually start by proving lemma two because it's somewhat easier. Um, and you can see kind of the general yoga, which is to work kind of order by order. Um, so proof of the inverse function theorem. So we have a map, uh, so recall we have a map of uh, infinity algebras, A to B. And we know that the linear part is invertible. So it has an inverse G1. Uh, so this is the identity on A and this is the identity on B. And we want to show we want to show that we can construct an inverse. So let's write what it means. Um, so what we want to basically find GKs right, uh, that extend G1. That's the idea. And how do we do this? Let's write the equation for uh, the composition of G with F at, uh, sorry, I think it's better to do F composed with G at the K Okay, let's do it. Let's do it first. The, the second, the, kind of the second level. So we want for every y one and y two this to vanish, right? Because basically, the com remember that when we compose, when we say the composition is the identity, we really mean that it's a morphism, which has the linear part is the identity, and all the higher parts vanish. So let's look at what this composition consists of. So we have f one composed with g two applied to y1, y2. And then we have uh, f2. Right, this is for any, so we want for any y1, y2 in B, this, this relation to hold. Uh, but g2 is, we don't know what it is yet. So how, how can we solve for g2? Well, we, we have this inverse, right? g1 is inverse to f1, so we can just apply f1 and we find the g2 we really have no choice but to define it to be g2 of y1, y2 is equal to minus um, f minus g1 applied to f2, g1, y1, g1, y2. OK? And we can draw this as a tree. People like to draw trees, um, <laughs> right, which, that has the operation f2 on the vertex. And all the edges have the g1. Um, our, our inverse for the linear part. Here we can put y1 and y2 as inputs, and the output is the morphism. So this is g2. Um, OK, let's do now the, the general case. Yeah. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's apply g1 to this relation. When we, g1 of 0 is 0. g1 of f1 is the identity. So we get just g2, y1, y2. We move it to the other side, and we get, we get this. OK, yeah. In the other direction. Mm. Yeah. So this is something you need to check. So I was me. Yeah. I guess. I guess maybe this is where you. Um, you need them. You want to vanish. Um, or. Yeah, OK, I guess this is where, where you need to, to check that. Um, G2. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, okay, I, I haven't, I should have maybe checked this more carefully, but I guess you know that it, it, this commutes with, with the differentials, right? So you, you really need just to assume the G1 commute, like this is a rough argument, but we need, to, I need to check the details. So um, I'm trying to convince you that there's really no choice in the construction and then, and then we, we need to check that the infinity relations actually hold. Um, and also that it's an inverse from the other direction, right? So there are two checks. Um, but let me, let me write to you just why GK, let's just convince ourselves that we have a formula for GK plus one. So it's, it's similar, it goes along similar lines, right? We apply, suppose we know the lower order Gs. So we want the relation to hold this relation. And here we have a sum over all the possible ways of applying F of some order greater than two to some g's of of lower of lower order. Okay. Um, and again, you see that you can apply the same technique, right? You apply you can apply g one, move it to the other side, and then you find a, for, a recursive formula for um, for g k plus one in terms of the lower order g's. GK plus one equals uh, the sum of all the possible ways. G one and here right, and if you and if you unwind, there's a plus minus here, and if you unwind the definition, you, get, you again get a sum over trees. Right, so for example, for G3, you get here uh, G1 applied to F. Uh, so, yeah, so you get G1 applied to F3 applied to G1, Y1, G1, Y3. And you have two ways of, right, you can apply G1 to F2. And here you have G2 of y1, y2, and y3, and, um, and the, other, the other way around. So y1. OK, so you can draw these as kind of diagrams. Um, here you have G1. Uh, I'll stop writing G1 on the edges. All the edges always have a G1 on them. And you have kind of two diagrams this to uh, three diagrams where with the lower order Fs, OK? So this is G3. And OK, and, and what I need to do, I, I think I don't want to spend, because I haven't, I should have probably prepared this a little bit better, but you need to just check um, that um, the infi a infinity morphism relations uh, hold. So basically, you check that infinity morphisms hold for, uh, for, uh, for G, and that it is also, and that basically we check the G, F composed with G is the identity, so we need to check the G composed with uh, F is also equal to the identity. Okay. So, um, so that's lemma two. And now I want to prove lemma one, the homological perturbation lemma. And we'll see that it's kind of, um, we'll find that really it's a kind of no choice construction. So um, almost no choice. So I'll explain what I mean. So what, what do we want to do? So we have, we have our uh, A infinity algebra. And we want to construct an A infinity structure on HA. 
and morphisms and homotopies that related to the, to the original infinity structure. So how do we do this? Um, so the strategy would be, OK, so first of all, we'll, we construct the linear part. So we'll have, what I mean by that is I want to construct the first components, i1 of the morphism i1 and pi1, as well as a homotopy h from a to itself that satisfies the following relations. So um, the first requirement is that i1 composed with pi1 is homo minus the identity, maybe I'll do this. The identity of a minus this is equal to dh plus hd. So for me, d from now, now on will just mean mu1 of a. Um, and we'll also want to introduce uh, the following relations that pi1 of h equals 0, h squared equals 0, and um, h of i1 equals 0. How can we uh, obtain this? Um, so the idea is very simple. You basically take the short exact sequences that define the, the homology and you split them. So we have um, the image of D. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll take up another board for this. So image of D maps to A, uh, sorry, maps to kernel of D, maps to the homology of A. And we also have the kind of tautological sequence um, of the kernel and the image. And we can just split them. So. So here I'm using the fact that I'm working in characteristic zero, okay? But, um, or I'm assuming that I'm working in characteristic zero. Um, so I think I want to call this i1 hat and this map pi1 hat, this one q, j, i, and uh, I don't think I'll need the other one. And, and, and you can now check that I'll define. So i1 will just be i composed with i1 hat. And pi1 will just be q composed with pi1 hat. And um, an h, which is probably the most interesting, will be. So we want to s a map from a. We go to first we apply pi1 hat. Then we go. Um, we apply tau 2 and then we apply tau 1. And, you, and then it's a very easy diagram chase to check that all the identities that I wrote before are satisfied. OK, so this is our linear setup. We indeed have kind of pi 1 and i 1 satisfy our inverse to each other on one direction. On the other direction, there's a homotopy between the composition and the identity. And now we're ready to kind of prove, or at least uh, sketch the proof of how we construct the higher um, the higher data. Um, and really what I'm trying to show you is that it's a, a kind of no choice proof in the sense that if you write down what has to hold and you work level by level, then, um, then you get the recursive relations that you need and there's no, you don't need to kind of um, write these magic formulas with trees, they just kind of pop out from from the, from the computation. So, um, OK, so, uh, so the, the next step is to kind of consider the morphism relation um, for. Yeah, so there, there are ways you can do it also. I mean, yeah, you can use the Hodge decomposition. Or, or in, I mean, you can think of it as a kind of homotopy retract. You're basically choosing, I, you think of I1 as choosing 
representative for your chronology classes. And, and then pi 1 is basically a way of projecting back from a not necessarily closed class to cohomology. We want that if we, if we go from, if we choose a representative, we want it to map back to, uh, to the original class. And also, if we, it will follow from the fact these are chain, chain maps that, um, that pi 1 composed with d0. So I mean, it will follow that if we take something and change it by something exact, we won't change the cohomology class. So really, this, this, this is just a way of choosing representatives for the homology classes and then choosing a compatible projection back onto cohomology. That's the way to think about it. And there are various ways you can, you can do this more or less canonically, depending on what kind of data you have. So, but this you can, you can do, always do. Um, yeah, maybe I should have said that pi1 and i1 are also chain maps. This is also something you need to check. I didn't state it as part of the, but it's, maybe I should. So, pi1, i1 are chain maps. Where, where on HA we take the trivial difference. Okay. Yes. The splitting? It's, I mean, if you have vector spaces and characteristic zero, you can always. Uh, wait, is it like, wait, was this splitting just in vector spaces? What? Yeah, just in vector spaces. Just a splitting uh, of vector spaces. Oh, and then you just have to check that. Yeah. That it's also like yeah, this map, oh, I know. And this map is, the, yeah. This is like essentially the differential, but map restricted to its image. Uh -huh. So it's just a map of vector spaces, and you split it. Yeah, now we're going to do the interesting part. This oh, is just oh, a oh, setup. It's only the first order term. Yeah, it's just only the first order term. Oh, okay. Remember the philosophy. We're, do we're doing okay. things order by order, so we started oh, okay. by setting things up linearly. Okay, so now what, what do we want to do? We want to check, uh, so we want to write the morphism relation, which says basically that uh, mu composed with i, I'll write it kind of is equal to i composed with mu tilde. Okay, and, and so let's assume Assume that mu tilde 1 is equal 0, mu tilde 2, mu tilde k have been constructed. Been constructed. And we'll construct mu k plus 1. And similarly, we, I'm going to assume that i1, which is given, also are, are given, OK? And now we want to construct the next, next term. So let's write this relation at the k plus 1 order. What do we get? Well, um, OK. I'll, I'll, I'll add a, another assumption on i k. OK, maybe I'll s say it now. Um, and I also want to assume, and we'll prove this by induction, that i greater than 2 lies in the image of h. OK? So the proof will be by induction. We'll basically construct the next order term from the previous ones. So what do we get? So here we get um, mu uh, k plus 1. No, actually, I don't want to like this. Let's, yeah, let's write it like this. d composed with i k plus 1 of something plus some mu which is not equal to 1. Right, so this is the left-hand side of the equation. This should equal, um, so we have here i1 composed with mu tilde, tilde k plus 1 plus, um, so here, here there's really a sum of all the possible ways of doing it. And here we have um, i, um, so I'm, I'm going to write some number greater than 2 and also less than k. Why less than k? Because if we take i k plus 1 and try to compose it on some mu tilde, we have to compose it with mu tilde 1, which is 0, right? So all, all the terms we get here are of the following form. And here we get some mu tilde of uh, less than k. We can also write here greater than 2 if you want. OK? 
Um, great. OK, so now what do we do? We basically apply pi 1 and apply h. And then we'll get our, our recursions. So uh, I keep losing that, right? What? D and mu, yeah, D, D is always mu 1 for this talk, for this uh, part of Okay. Yeah, mu is not, yeah, it's kind of my <laughs> funny notation. So here it's mu 2, mu 3, up to mu whatever, uh, but not equal to 1. And the other notation is good. Okay. So let's apply pi 1. What do we get? So pi 1 of i1 is the identity, right? Uh, OK, let's start from this side. Pi 1 of d is equal to, right, pi 1 is a, morph is a map of complexes. So pi 1 of d is 0, because it maps to the, com to the complex with trivial differential. Um, and here, um, yeah, so here we'll get just pi 1 of, of mu not equal to 1. This, this term will survive. I should have written it in the other direction. It comes out nicely. But. So here we get um, so this is the only term that survives from the left-hand side. And what do we get here? Pi 1 of i1 is the identity. Um, and let me already mention that pi 1 of h, remember we assumed pi 1 of h is 0. And I'm proving by induction, I'm assuming that all the i's are in the image of h. So this vanishes as well. So we just get that this equals to, um, this equals to what we want, right? Mu tilde k plus 1. OK? So we have one formula. Now let's apply h. What do we get? Well, hd is not exactly the identity, right? But it, hd is equal to, uh, maybe I'll write it here again, hd plus dh equals the identity of a uh, minus, did I write it the other way around? Let's write it like this, i pi minus the identity. Um, so we see that we can, it follows that h of d equals i pi minus the identity of a minus dh. Um, so we get, um, here we get dh minus i pi minus the identity applied to i k plus 1. Now let's look at the other terms. So here we get this term. I mean, it just equals to h um, mu not equal to 1 and lower order terms. And on the other side of the equation, what do we get? Well, we, get, we apply h to i1. That is 0 by one of the assumptions on the linear part. Uh, we apply h. And we apply, when we apply to h to this, it also vanishes because h squared equals 0. That was another assumption. So that's really the end of this relation. Um, but let's simplify just a little bit more. So note that here we have uh, i k plus 1. Where we want to prove that it lies in the image of h. So if we, if we will succeed, this, will, this term will vanish. Um, and then this term will vanish as well, because pi h also equal to 0. Right? We're using all these, these relations. So basically, we get that um, we can write, this implies that i k plus 1 equals, um, right? so the minus and the minus, can't, we move it to the other side. We just get that it equals to h mu naught equal to 1, i less than k. OK. And, and note that indeed, we find that, H, that, that i k plus 1 lies in the image of h if we, if we do this. So, I, and so we basically f find that we can construct, um, it's, so I said it's an almost no choice proof because really we had to add this extra assumption. But other than that, we have two recursions that define i, 
the top order IK in terms of the lower order ones, and also this one is written kind of in the wrong direction. And also uh, the definition of mu tilde k plus one in terms of lower orders, of lower order operation. Okay, so uh, now we need to check again. Uh, so what do we need to check? We need to check that um, really, uh, first of all, that um, or maybe const we, we we take a similar path to proving let me say it like this. Uh, construction of pi is similar, and this I actually checked, and the homotopy should be similar as well, although I'll admit that I haven't, uh, and the homotopy. So remember, we have to construct a homotopy i pi to the identity should also be like order by order kind of check. Um, so, okay, so this kind of finishes the proof of, uh, of them. Let me just say something about trees and maybe give it an example. Yeah. Yes, pi 1 composed with h is 0. No, I only use the fact that pi 1, I, I applied pi 1 and I applied h. So where do you think so that I cheated? The top one or the bottom one? Ah, yes, yes, sorry, thank you. Thank you. This is I1 and pi1. Yes. Yeah, it's something I, I said that if you construct. If you can, if you, you can just check that if you take h squared, then here you have pi one ah, composed with tau one. Um, so pi one, this is also a short exact sequence, right? So pi one hat composed with tau one is equal to zero. It just follows from this construction. And in other constructions, you can also make it work. Sometimes people don't use the splitting. I thought this was the most elementary way to set things up. Okay, but it's a reasonable condition that you can always assume. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, will it uh, becomes, uh, will the notation become simpler and more compact? So I don't think it will really become, but the, it will become more conceptual. I think there should be a way of saying this, like you're doing here the deformation theory of, of you know, of, of, your, of your object with respect to, to the filtration that I mentioned, the length filtration. But so I tried. So it can become more conceptual. That's what? Yeah. I, I, I think it can be. I'm not, I don't consider myself an expert, but. <laughs> um, uh, if somebody wants to add, then, okay. Um, okay, so uh, what did I want to say? Um, I want to say something about trees. So just what this translates to in practice, these recursive the definitions. What? Like one of the first papers on trees is the bar complex, but I'm not sure if it's super simple. If it's what? It's so simple? It's not like bar yeah. I mean, I started thinking about this, and you know, you can kind of define what is a square zero. Like, the difference between two, mo two co algebra morphisms is really a square zero. Uh, you, you know, you can think about it as like having square zero co extensions. But then I realized that I'm not, never going to be able to say it in an hour, so I decided to take this more elementary approach. But, you know, what are we doing here? We are really just doing things order by order, and I think you should translate it, you should be able to translate it into a more conceptual. Thing. Um, but I don't know uh, if it's been done. Okay, so I wanted to say something about what? Do I have, how much time do I have? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. So let me just say what this trans, these recursives translate to in terms of trees and then give you a fun exercise, um, which is a, will be kind of an example. So, um, so you know, this recursion really says that if you unwind it, um, you, you'll find that you know, i is given by a sum over trees, where we have h, and h, h at the top, some operation mu, 
not equal to one. I'm just reading off the, and here the, the subtrees are themselves uh, eyes, right? Are given by, by some application of an eye. So, so they're also given by the same kind of uh, operations. Uh, maybe I'll draw, maybe I'll draw a somewhat more general case. This might be already I1. So you always have I1 at the leaves. That's the only thing you can start with. And then you always have H's on the internal edges. And on the vertices, you have some, uh, the vertices are always have incoming degree greater than or equal to 2. And you know, they correspond to these mu not, not equal to 1. So this is an example of one contribution to the sixth order term in I, I6. I, is this clear? I mean, it's just unwinding the recursive definition. And similarly, if you want to look at a new tilde, then you find that it's given by a sum over trees with pi at the top, pi 1 at the top. And, um, and, then, and then you go back to the same kind of uh, thing. So the only difference is really there. So this is, this is the kind of thing you get. Um, OK, so now a fun exercise. Just so you see that this is not just algebraic nonsense and you can actually get some geometric stuff from it. I mean, I guess all the talks today should convince you that there's a lot of geometry behind this. But here's a more elementary example. So consider the topological space X, which is just a complement of the Borromean rings. In S3. So the Borromean rings, you can draw them as follows. So just take one ring and another ring, and then a third ring that should be So each ring is kind of inside one of the rings and outside the other. So no two rings are entangled, but the three of them cannot be taken apart. You can see it kind of if you play with it a little bit. Um, and what I want to claim is that we have seen already that any, any DG algebra, oh, we said that any DG category gives an A infinity category. And similarly, any DG algebra, any yeah, any DGA gives, gives uh, an A infinity category. So in this case, consider the cotrains on X. Say singular cotrains on X. With the usual co-boundary operator and the cup product. So these will be my mu1 and mu2. And we set all the higher operations, mu k equal to 0, for k greater than or equal to 3. And then I want to, uh, and uh, the exercise is basically to compute the, the model, the, um, the infinity structure on the cohomology. Um, so I want to tell you kind of what the answer is. So the cohomology of x, you can use Alexander duality to see right, it's a complement of some space inside S3. So you can use Alexander duality to compute it. And it's just equal to r times the unit in degree 0. And then we have three generators in degree 1. This is vector space generators um, in degree 1 corresponding to the represented by disks filling the, uh, the, each of the three rings. And then, um, or from correct dual to this. Um, and then we have uh, two generators in degree two, which correspond, okay, so we can call them alpha one, two, alpha two, three, which are basically paths represented by paths connecting, let's say this is one, two, and three, so you can just choose a path with boundary on these two. Um, OK, maybe, uh, I don't know if, uh, if I'll have time, I'll draw some more. But let me just tell you what the uh, operations come out to be. So 
Um, so mu tilde 1 is 0 by construction. Mu tilde 2 is also 0. And this reflects, this is, this is just a cup product on cohomology, and the vanishing of it reflects the fact that no two rings are connected. So mu tilde 1 equals 0. So this is like show. <laughs> mu tilde 2 equals 0, and this reflects the fact that no two rings are connected. Or linked, maybe, you better. And mu tilde 3 is non-zero. Um, so if I did the computation correctly, I think mu tilde 3 of gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3 should equal to alpha 1, 2 plus alpha 2, 3. And similarly, you can, you always have the kind of path from, from the two endpoints. So, um, but it's non-zero, and this reflects, reflects the fact fact rings are linked. Um, and you can set things up that the higher operations vanish. I'm not sure if you can always, uh, if they always have to vanish, or depending on how you split your sequences, but you can set it up so the higher operations vanish. Um, so how are we doing on time? Do you, maybe I should, uh, what? OK, so maybe I can, I can stop here um, if there are any questions. Yeah? Uh, um, are you saying that is the new filter of the time intrinsically or just in terms of the composing that composes the time? What do you mean intrinsically? Depends well, on the. Yeah, mu tilde is an A-infinity structure on HA. It's not unique in the sense that there were choices in, in the proof, but it is unique in the essential, in an essentially unique. Like, so, uh, like unique for admitting this for, so that the level. What? Like unique so that the, so that the product like set of zero holds. Yeah, I mean, you can show, for example, it, it, uh, that you can, um, it essentially follows from the theorem, right? That you, if you have any quasi-isomorphism, then you can, um, then it's invertible up to homotopy. So if you have another infinity structure and it's quasi-isomorphic, if you, if you do the construction with another homotopy operator, you can easily see that it's quasi-isomorphic to the original one, right. right? And then it will be homotopy equivalent to the original one. So. Uh, yeah. Oh, on, on cohomology, yes. Yeah, sorry. As the, so if you just talk about the structure on the level of cohomology, it will just be Isomorphic. Oh, so, right, so quasi isomorphism doesn't that doesn't play like, care of the mu tilde. Quasi isomorphism doesn't what? Like the, the mu tilde of the domain like is it is like is that true that it's also like it's only about the mass of the H I's. I'm not sure. You're saying oh, the mu tildes like, don't matter? Or? No, no, well I guess like the quasi isomorphism I, I just like asked about the definitions because I forgot, like between two A infinity things. Mm -hmm. Then it's like a statement about the mass of the Rakovic. Oh, you're asking about the definition of a quasi-isomorphism? I'm sorry. Right, right, right. Oh, OK, sorry. I, I just didn't understand uh, what the question was about. So yeah, so the definition is that you have a map from A, B. In the case, let's talk about algebras. It's the sa essentially the same for categories. Um, so yeah, you just require that uh, it's a morphism of A infinity algebras. Uh, a and the requirement is that HF1 is invertible. It's an isomorphism. Uh, so, guess, uh, so you can. No, H of oh, one okay. is not a map. Oh. But you're right that you can kind of, uh, in general, when you have a map 
uh, amorphism, you can build from it a, a map from H A to H B with the associated structures. That is true. Um, okay. So um, okay. Any other? Yeah. Yeah, so the usual proof, maybe I should say that. Uh, the, the way I, I've seen it as an exercise, kind of here's the formula, use these trees with plus minus somewhere. And then you can just check that these mu tildes uh, satisfy the infinity relation. Um, by the way, you can also check it directly from the recursive definition that I gave. So you need to check that the mu tildes actually sat. I, I only showed you that they satisfy the morphism relation, but you need to actually check. Yeah, I should have written that, written that down. You need to check that mu tilde composed with mu tilde gives zero. Um, so you can do it either, you can also do it directly from the diagrams and, and then it kind of seems like a magic, like someone made up these diagrams and then you check that you get the structure. I try to sh convince you that you can actually, um, you really have very little choice in constructing them. Um, okay. Well, thank you.